Hey everyone, welcome to lecture seven. Uh, this is the second part of networking. Uh, last week we talked about networking just to give you a sense of how networking works. And now this week we're going to be talking about how to actually implement it in code. So let's jump right into it with some review. Uh, first off, which of the following is not a type of HTTP request? Uh, if you remember from last week, uh, if you clicked on Postman, you can see all of the possible HTTP requests that you can make and create was not actually included in them. If you want to create something, you can just use a post request. And what is the JSON? Uh, we can go through the answers for these. So uh, you have array of dictionaries with key value pairs, dictionaries with key value pairs, a type of model object in Swift and a CocoaPod. Well, it's definitely not a CocoaPod because those are external libraries and JSON isn't that. Uh, is not a type of model object in Swift. It's supposed to be JavaScript object notation. So it's something completely separate from Swift. And now between the first two choices, it's not necessarily an array of dictionaries. Uh, it's actually just a dictionary with key value pairs. So it's B. Uh, so let's do some closure review before we start with the code because networking has a lot of closures and you'll see soon why. So remember that closures are just basically anonymous functions, just functions without names. So you can put code in between braces and you'd run that code if you call it closure. So for example, uh, if you wanted to make a function that adds two numbers, but you wanted to make it a closure so it doesn't actually have a specific name attached to it, you declare a variable that takes in two ints and you put them in parentheses and it returns with the arrow key another int and then between the braces, you're going to put the two parameters that you take in, and you're going to return both of those parameters uh, added up. And so let closure three equal to add two numbers closure one comma two would evaluate for, with closure three equaling three. Uh, another case you want to use closures for is if you want to do um, some higher order functions like mapping a list, filtering a list, or sorting a list. Uh, so for example, uh, this is an example from last week as well. If you want to map a list so that you can uh, uh, return true if the number is greater than or equal to zero or false, if not, uh, then you would do this structure where I would do list.map. Map takes in a closure, which takes in a number. And uh, well, map doesn't necessarily take a number. You can pass in whatever with it. Uh, it's a generic type. So in this case, we're passing in a number and we're going to return a Boolean, which is why we return number greater than or equal to zero. So when we go through this list, we have negative 23 that is not greater than or equal to zero. So in its place, you will return false. And this is how map would work for the rest of the values too. So this is how closures work with networking. Now, this looks pretty intimidating, but it's fine. We'll get through this together. Uh, remember that we use CocoaPods to install external libraries that take care of the networking. So this is the easiest it's going to get with Alamo Fire. Uh, you'd have to do a whole lot of other uh, coding, which is even more complicated if it weren't for this. So we're just going to stick to this. We'll go through it bit by bit and the demo is going to involve three of these uh, functions. So uh, by the end of it, you should be pretty comfortable with doing this on your own. So uh, Let's just get started. Uh, remember that if you're requesting something from a server, it's going to take some time. It's not instantaneous. So because of that, we want to run our code inside of a closure. So let's start with the beginning line, alamofire.request. Uh, alamofire is the library that we're going to use, which we're going to install through CocoaPods. And our request is a function of that library. And what we're going to do is pass in two parameters, uh, the endpoint, which is what we're hitting on the server, and the method is get. So we're going to get something from the server. As you can see, this function is called get classes. Then we want to validate it, which I'll go more into detail when I'm actually using that. And then dot response JSON is going to take a completion. And that's why you see the braces. So we want to run a closure for this networking request. So when we're done with the networking request, we want to run the closure. Uh, and when we get that, response back. As you can see, there's a response parameter in disclosure. We want to check if it was a successful or a failure response. And if it's successful, we want to decode it because it's going to be passed to the to our networking manager as a JSON. 
and we want to decode it so that we can get that information and pass it to our completion. Because let's say I get, uh, let's say uh, the common example here says convert JSON to an array of courses. Let's say I have courses and I want to display them on a table view, right? If I just add them to my array, then I need to, well, first of all, I need to add them to my array, right? So that's why we need a completion because sure, I got an array of courses, but so now what, right? I need to set it equal somewhere and that's what the completion is for. And after I set it equal to the array, remember that I need to reload my table view, otherwise I'm not gonna see any difference. Uh, one thing that you may have noticed is uh, unlike uh, the extra credit project or closures that you've seen in the past, uh, we have an at escaping keyword. And the reason we want to do this is because we don't want to uh, call this function and then wait till the server res returns a successful or a failure response. We want to let it run in the background while we're doing other stuff because otherwise our app is just going to freeze up and that's not gonna be a good user experience for whatever users use your app. So let's go a little bit more into networking uh, and uh, we're going to be going over networking in such a way that you'll understand what the parameters are for the request function. So first off, remember that with networking, you can retrieve, update, delete, and add data. Remember CRUD, CRUD is uh, create, retrieve, update, and delete. And uh, with the CRUD, uh, with CRUD, we're going to be able to kind of guess what our request, our endpoints are gonna look like. So let's say I wanted to create a user, I would do uh, slash users, uh, well, uh, slash user slash, that would be the route that I'm going to hit on the server. Uh, let's say I want to do something to a specific user, it'd be that same route and then I'd add a number after it. The nice thing about CRUD is that I can just kind of guess what endpoint I'm supposed to hit if I want to do something. And you'll see that as we're uh, going through the demo. So let's go on uh, to parameter encoding. Uh, sometimes you're going to want to hit endpoints, but sometimes you want to pass information to. Let's say I want to search for something specific. I want to uh, create a user. I need to pass information for that created user. So uh, you're going to want to do specific types of encoding when I'm passing data. And the types of methods that we have for encoding, first off, uh, recall that if you're trying to do a GET request, you can have query parameters. So if you go on Google right now and you search something up, you're going to see that there's gonna be a slash search and then there's gonna be a question mark and then there's gonna be some key and there's gonna be an equal signs and a value. And then there might be an ampersand as well, like you see here. So in this case, uh, our endpoint is uh, getrequest.com slash API slash search. And this is a get request. And the parameters that we're passing in are query whose value is dogs and page whose value is one. So the encoding method that you want to use for this is URL encoding on default. For post requests, uh, we're going to be passing something similar, but the thing is we want to encode this into a JSON. And so uh, as you see with JSONs, right, you need the braces and it's gonna be very similar. Uh, instead of uh, the brackets, which you're gonna use uh, when we're networking, uh, you're gonna always be using these brackets to pass these parameters, but these encoding methods are going to take care of it and put it in the format that you need. So for post requests, you'd want to use JSON encoding.default. Uh, URL encoding.default for get requests because those parameters are going to go into the URL and then JSON encoding.default because you need to pass data to a post request through a JSON. Uh, and I wanted to make a clarification. Uh, when I said API last lecture, I didn't actually define what an API is. So it just stands for application programming interface. And you can think of an API as uh, with the Word document that I showed you, uh, there was like a whole bunch of endpoints and there was a description of what you had to send over or what would happen if you hit the endpoint and you get something back. It's just going to be a description of what you can do with a certain type of application. For example, uh, Google has a calendar API. If you wanted to make an app with Google's calendar, uh, you can just hit their API and there's a public API that you can look up online. There's also Spotify APIs and there's like many types of APIs for uh, anything that's server related. Uh, API doesn't necessarily need to relate to servers. You can think of an API as, for example, if I want to use a library in Python, right? They have uh, documentation and that can uh, count as an API because you look at their uh, functions and that tells you what you can do with the library. So 
which is another kind of API. So let's talk about decoding server responses. Uh, let's come up with an example. So let's say we want we have a server that returns class information. So we're going to have a function here, get classes. We're going to make a request. We have an endpoint that will define somewhere else in the code. And we want to get the classes. So our method is going to be dog get. We need to validate it. And then we're going to uh, uh, use a completion to deal with the response that we get back from the server once it comes back. And in the case where it's successful, we're just going to print out the JSON that we get. Otherwise, we're going to print out the error that we got. So let's say we print out the JSON and we get a JSON that looks like this. Uh, you'll see that at the very beginning, there's data and data's key. The data is the key, and then it has a value, which is just an object that contains classes. And then classes is a key that has a value of a list of a whole bunch of these other objects, which looks like they represent classes, right? So how are we going to convert this JSON into our own model objects? Because we need a way to represent these in Swift. Uh, one dot is you do know that you have an array of a whole bunch of these objects and all these objects look like they're going to be some kind of course. So I can just make a struct that has those properties. Say I have a name for a course, I have the code for that course. They have some instructors and you can say whether or not you're enrolled in that course, you would have a struct that has all of these properties. But let's take it even simpler. Uh, this is considering the case where we have a list, but let's just consider a single course to begin with, right? And to do that, it's just going to be course again, right? But if you want to be able to decode this simple course into a struct or something into Swift, it needs to be uh, conforming to the codable protocol. And what that means is that if I have something that is a course, it should be able to, oh, the, codable, the codable protocol is also conforming to uh, decodable and encodable because we want to be able to decode and encode our JSONs. We want to decode JSONs that we get from the server we're getting stuff. And if we need to send things over, we also want to be able to encode it, say in the post request for encoding or a get request for decoding. Uh, now, if we're getting the courses, we're gonna want to use a JSON decoder and we're gonna convert the JSON into a course object, just like how we want. And then we'll be able to use that. Uh, note that we are using the same exact naming of the JSON in our struct. We need to do this if we want to be able to decode it properly. So now let's actually just get started with an example. Uh, so let's open up our example and this is going to be posted on the website. Uh, so let's start this up. There you go. So this is going to be based off of the artificial invasion uh, API that we used last time. Uh, but first, let's take a look at this, right? So it looks like I have a table view that has seven values. It's the name of the entire course staff. Uh, and there is a number after all of them. So this is actually uh, created here. We have some dummy data, just like you did for uh, project four. Uh, we have an ID zero to seven, and we have the names of everyone. And then we set them into user data. Looks like we have this shown user data. So uh, let's play around with this so you can have some intuition for how this works. So uh, one thing I can do is I can click on edit and I'll see I have the ability to delete things. Uh, I can also just swipe left and delete. And I can just swipe to and just click on delete. And I also have the ability to uh, scroll up and refresh. So let me try that again. So it's going to take three seconds to refresh and then everything comes back. So let's take a look at how this is happening. Uh, if we look over here, right? We have something called a refresh control first of all. And I also have a link here if you want to learn how to use refresh controls. But basically uh, whenever I scroll up, I'm going to access this refresh control. I have a target here, which is going to call refresh data, just like how we do with buttons. So whenever I call, uh, whenever I scroll up and I do the, I get the refresh control to show up, it's going to go into this function. And then I have this thing over here, dispatchq.main.asyncafter. So what this is just going to do 
is uh, if you look here, it has a deadline from now till three seconds. So all this is doing is it's going to call this code. It's going to make this code run in three seconds. So it's going to be asynchronous versus synchronous where everything runs in order. So here I'm setting self.shown user data equal to self.user data. I reload and then I stop the refresh animation. So this isn't really doing any networking, even though it does look like it looks like, you know, it's loading for three seconds and then it stops, right? But this has no networking at all. If I wanted to also add something over here, I can try test and submit. Uh, I will also have a print statement over here. And this is taken care of uh, right here. I'm adding this to the right bar button item. It's on the right. And the target, uh, what we're calling this selector, uh, we're calling this function present create alert. And it's just going to present an alert, which I set up previously in setup views over here. And it's going to have an action, submit. Also, this one does have a link too, if you want to learn how to make uh, uh, UI alert controllers in specific detail. So uh, I have something over here where I am checking to see if I wrote anything first. And I'm also trimming all the white lines. So if I were to say, type in Bob and have a whole bunch of spaces, submit is going to print out Bob with no spaces because it's getting rid of all that empty space because we don't want that. And all it's doing is printing here. So you also notice here that I have these marks, right? This is where we would want to post data, right? Because if I click on add and I type something in here, I'd want this to be sent back to the server and I want to do something about that. Uh, same thing with here. Right now, all this is doing is it's setting shown user data equal to user data. And if you look at the table views down here as well, you're going to see that everything is based off of shown user data. So all it's really doing is that if I were to delete anything and I were to refresh, after three seconds, it's just going to have the original data that I have stored in user data from here. So it's not really interesting. It's not doing any networking. So let's actually put networking into this. Uh, so first things first, uh, if you like to follow along with these lectures, uh, I'm here in my directory uh, for artificial invasion. Uh, what I can do if you follow along from last lecture, you'll notice that there's this AI.db. AI this is actually containing all of data that you mess around with last lecture. Uh, we can just remove that and it's going to give us a clean database to start off with. So remember that you want to uh, do virtual env vem if you haven't done that before. But if you have, it should still be in your directory, in which case I want to press dot vem bin activate. And then I should still have everything installed from last time. But if, again, you're starting from new, I recommend watching the previous lecture or just do pip install. You want to do it recursively to get everything from the requirements.txt. You can try that here and it looks like everything is installed properly. Uh, looks like I did something over here, but I think that should be fine. Uh, let's try to start up the server. Okay, it is not fine. Let me fix this. Okay, uh, one second. Okay, we're back. So it was the same library issue. It looks like I didn't fix it in the last lecture. So I just made a push to the GitHub repo and it should be fixed now. So uh, if I were to run this now, uh, I have the server running. So this is our endpoint, recall. So let's just go into Postman and let's play around with it. Uh, let's make this a bit smaller and just make this bigger. Let's put touchpad. There we go. Okay. So let's copy this. And let's make sure everything's working as intended. Okay. Uh, so the get request, it looks like we're getting the all clear with this. Um, let's try. Uh, so the API doc is here. And remember that we uh, have uh, a get, and this is our route slash API slash user slash. Don't forget the last slash, you're going to get issues. Um, so we want to put API slash users here. If I click send, you're gonna see that 
this works out. Uh, it's like I didn't need a slash over here. This is weird. But make sure to have the slash inside of the code for Swift or you're going to get an issue with it. Um, so right now it's empty because uh, we don't have anything in there. So let's actually create some stuff. I'm going to post and I need to go into the body. Uh, and we're going to go into JSON. And if we want to create a user, I'll go to create user. We want to put username and some user input. So put username and we'll put in Bob. I'll post and now we created Bob. So let's try to get our users again. And here's Bob. Let's create another user, Joe. And this works well. So let's try to get again. And now we have two users. Let's say I wanted to delete Bob. Uh, I would just delete. And to delete Bob, I just have to put in Bob's ID. And you can just click here and verify that I need to pass in an ID for Bob. And uh, remember, uh, like I said for CRUD, right? I didn't even have to look at the API because I knew, okay, I want to delete a specific user. So it's gonna be in the users route and I'm going to add the specific ID after it with uh, a slash at the end as well. And if I delete Bob, I'm going to get Bob returned. So if I were to get and I'm going to backspace because I want to get all the users. I'm going to get Joe here. So that's just a quick reminder of how uh, this API works. And uh, let's just go into the code and figure out how we're going to do this stuff. So uh, we can start with trying to get the users. So if we were to get all the users right now, we would get Joe. Because if we run this here, I get just Joe and an ID of two. So what I'm expecting to see is Joe here with a two by their name. Uh, so first off, let's clean up this code a bit. I don't want to use this shown user data because this is just creating the illusion that there's some kind of networking. So let's remove this line 24. And if I remove this, I should get a bunch of errors telling me where the other stuff is. So I'm gonna get rid of this. We're gonna go down and it looks like we want to get rid of this too. Let's go down and here. We don't want to remove this. We want to replace this with user data because we want to show the user data. We want to do the same here. And then one more time, we want to do the same here. Uh, so let's stop and rerun to see if this is working properly. Okay. Uh, Let's delete one and let's see if we refresh and anything happens. And it doesn't, which is what we wanted because we don't want to create the illusion of uh, actually uh, retrieving stuff from networking. So let's start with getting everything. Uh, first things first, we want to make a struct. We go here. This is what we're using to represent our dummy data, right? In fact, another thing we can do, we're not gonna use dummy data. So we can just get rid of this or we can just comment this out for now. Uh, let's run this one more time and verify that things are fine. Oh yeah, now we have nothing here because we commented this out. So we never actually created dummy data to add to user data. So uh, if we go into here, this is where our models are. And it looks like we have an ID and a username, which is how we created these. Uh, now recall from lecture that we want to create something that matches what the JSON will look like. So what exactly matches this JSON? Uh, we have a success true and a data. So let's start with that. Uh, Actually, let's start even simpler. Let's start with this inner part. This is very similar to the courses uh, in the slides. So if we want to copy this, this looks like it's a specific user. So I'm going to comment out uh, these class, this class, and I'm just gonna make it a struct. The reason I wanna make it a struct is because if I'm gonna be working with networking, 
it's nicer to use structs because remember that structs are value types, not reference types. So if I wanted to mess around with what I get from the server, uh, if I wanted to have it in multiple places, I'd be working with copies of it, not references. And then that helps me debug in case maybe for some reason uh, I accidentally changed something that, that was referenced and now it's different somewhere else. Now I'm going to get confused. Is it because I use a class or is it because of the networking? It's just easier to use structs to make the process very simple. So we want to have an ID, which is an integer. And we don't want to define it like that. We want to do similar to how we did for a class. We want to create an ID. And now we want to create a username is a string. Now, all I really need for this app are these two properties. I don't have to get everything, but that doesn't mean that I'm not going to get everything when I make this response. I will, but I only care about these two fields, so I'm not going to bother with the characters or friends because we're not going to be messing around with those in this demo. Um, so now we have structs. Now what else do we need? We need to have something representing the actual JSON itself, because we still need to have something representing the JSON because I need to decode the entire JSON, not just the inner part. So to do that, I can call this, say, uh, users response, because this JSON is a response from the server that contains all the users. And I'm going to have some variable success. And it looks like that's a Boolean. So I'm going to make this a type bool. And then I'm going to have a user list. So the key is data. So I'm going to call it data. And it's a user list. So I just say it's a user list. So this is fine. And now I have structs that, is rep uh, that are representing the data, but it's not completely done yet. Because remember that I'm trying to use these structs to be able to decode a JSON. And if I want to be able to store these JSONs into these structs, these, JS uh, these structs need to be decodable. And to do that, I need to make them conform to codable. So if I make this conform to codable, we'll give it a couple of seconds and I'm going to get an error because it says that it doesn't conform to decodable or encodable. Because remember, if you're making it conform to codable, it conforms to also decodable and encodable. And the reason I'm getting this error is because I have users here and this isn't conforming to decodable or encodable. So I need to also make this codable. And now my error should go away. So now we have our models and we're going to use these models to actually decode a JSON, but we need to decode this JSON. And to, that, uh, to do that, we're going to organize all of our code into a new file, which we're going to call network manager. And we can go into file. It can just be a Swift file because we're not going to add any UI to it. It's going to be one big class and we can call this network manager. Okay, and now we're going to make a class called Network Manager. So in here, uh, remember that, or instead of remembering, I can just show you. Uh, we'll go over here. So we're going to need an endpoint to pass into this LMO fire requests function. And remember that our endpoints always have this beginning part, and this is what we're going to call host. So I only want one network manager. All of my variables inside of the network manager are going to be used once. So I'm just going to make this a static variable. And we're going to call this host. And I'm going to copy this. There we go. This is our host. And we're going to use this throughout our network manager. So let's just define the functions that we're going to need. Uh, in this demo, we're going to be able to get a V user. We want to be able to create a user, and we want to be able to delete a user. So let's just make those functions. So uh, make another static function, and let's call this get users. Uh, we need to take in some parameters. Uh, if I want to get users, I want to be able to do something after I got a user. And so I'm going to need a completion. So let's, let's extend this to 
So I want this to take in a completion. And what is this completion gonna take? At the end of this response, once I get a response and it's a successful response, I'm gonna have what I expect to have. Uh, remember that I'm trying to decode this so that I have a list of users because that's what I want to end up with in the end. So if I end up with a list of users and I want to do stuff with it after the response, I need to have a completion that takes in a list of users. And to do that, we need to declare this as a type, uh, this user. So this is the parameter that my closure, uh, the completion is going to take. And this is going to return nothing because I don't need to return anything. I just want to uh, set user data equal to this user's list and maybe reload the table view after. Uh, and now let's just close this and uh, let's go to the next function we wanna do. So now I can get all the users, but I also wanna be able to create users. So let's create, well, I want to create a single user. I can only create one user at a time uh, from this API. So to create a user, uh, what do I need to create a user? Uh, let's go back in the API. Uh, API is here. Uh, it looks like I need to have a username in the request. So if I'm going to call create user, I need to have a username first of all. So let's make it take in some username and we're going to make it a type string. And I want to do something with that user afterward probably. And in this case, I'm only going to get a user back. If you see here, if my user was successfully created, I'm going to get it back with the ID, the new ID it has and the username that I inputted to begin with. So I wanna use this and uh, it's not necessary to use this, uh, but I'm going to show you uh, why it would be beneficial to have this uh, return in the completion. And we'll try both ways when we get to that point. So I only want a user to be passed into this completion because I am only gonna have one single user to mess around with. And again, I don't want to return anything because I don't need to return anything in this case. So we have our second one. And now the last thing we want to do is we want to be able to delete a user. So what am I gonna pass into this case? Uh, I want to delete a user, but which user am I gonna delete? Should I pass in username again so I can delete a user? Uh, let's look at the API again. And if you click here, I want to delete a specific user. So I'm not actually passing anything into uh, the API. I'm just deleting based on this endpoint. And you'll see here that I need to pass in the ID inside of the endpoint itself. So that means I'm gonna need to take in some ID, which is an integer uh, over here. And I'm not sure yet if I want to uh, have a completion to delete a user. Uh, I don't know if I wanna do anything after I delete a user. So let's just do it uh, and let's just see what we come up with when we get to that point. Uh, so I'm going to get a user when I delete something. So let's just go over here and pass in user just like how we did for creating a user and it's not gonna return anything. So great, now we have our three functions and now we can start implementing them. Uh, so let's take a look. We want to do get users. And the first thing that we need to do is we want to use Alamo Fire. So first off, we need to import Alamo Fire. No autocomplete, that's bad. And that's because we didn't actually uh, initialize CocoaPods. So remember, if you want to use external libraries, uh, you need to install them with CocoaPods and you're gonna need to enter uh, the .xc workspace that it creates. So uh, I can just comment this out. Uh, let's stop this and let's just verify that everything is working before we move on to the next step. Okay, uh, well, yeah, it didn't crash, so that's good. Great, uh, no, it did, but that's because it closed it wrong. Um, so let's close this out because we're not gonna be using that after we set up CocoaPods. Um, so uh, if you haven't installed CocoaPods yet in this part of the lecture, uh, stop, go on the website and figure out how to install them. If you're having difficulties, please message me or any of the course of immediately. This is, this is necessary for this project. So assuming that you already have CocoaPods installed, uh, 
I'm going to want to be in this directory while I'm doing this. So you can just navigate to whatever directory you are going to use Cocoa Pods for. And I want to do pod init. When I hit enter for this, you're going to see that I just created a pod file. So let's actually take a look at this pod file and see what's inside of it. Uh, and so I have uh, this version over here. I have these other things, but the important thing is over here, pods for networking. Now, this isn't necessarily uh, pods for networking. It's just that the name of my project is networking. And so that's why it says pods for networking. But here is where we want to put our networking pods, uh, specifically Al Alamo Fire. And to do that, I want to type in pod and I want it to be lowercase, so do that. And I'm going to put uh, single quotes and I'm going to type in Alamo Fire in between. I'm going to save this. I can close this out. And now once I've done that, I want to pod install. And I'll install Alamo Fire. So now we'll see that a whole bunch of stuff generated. Uh, we got pods and this is where all of our pods are actually going to be. We got a pod file lock. And that is just going to ensure that if you change a version inside of your pod file, it's going to give you some issue. Uh, if you want to change versions in your pod file, uh, you need to delete this. Uh, so uh, just something if you're ever working with Cocoa Pods and you're having Cocoa Pod issues. And then we got this XC workspace. This is where we want to work on from now on. We never use the Xcode project for that. And we want to click on here because we want to use our networking. Uh, space and we want to open this folder and now we're basically where we started so now we can go on network manager again and uh, i'll just retype this and yes autocomplete that means everything worked out so let's get started uh if i type in alamo fire and i put a dot and request i'm not going to get any autocomplete and reason for that is because now alamo fire is just using uh AF and everything will work after that. So just type in AF instead of Alamo Fire. Uh, we want to request something specific. Uh, this is a GET request. Uh, so whenever you are going to select one of these requests from the autocomplete, I recommend using the one that says encoding instead of encoder. And uh, you'll see why when we're doing the create users. But for now, let's just use this one. And now we're gonna get a whole bunch of stuff. So let's just go one by one through uh, the types. So first of all, I have this thing, convertible, colon, you are convertible. What is this? Uh, let's go back in the slides. And uh, this is where you pass the endpoint. So what is our endpoint? Uh, we have the host here, but let's form the endpoint. Uh, so let endpoint equal to, uh, our endpoint is always gonna contain our host. So I can just do, this with syntax instead of some string concatenation. And I already have a slash, so I don't need to put a slash. Uh, if I go back here, if I want to create or actually get all users, is API slash users slash. So uh, API slash users slash. This is my endpoint. And I'm going to pass it into here. So that part's done. What is the method I'm using? Get users gets users, it's a get method. Am I passing in any parameters? Not for a get, all I'm doing is I'm just hitting the endpoint. So I don't need this. Am I encoding it in any specific way? Remember that we're doing parameter encoding, you need parameters to begin with. So we don't need to worry about that one. And then the rest of these, you don't ever have to worry about. So we can just get rid of all of this. And that's all we need to put inside of the request function. Now, I want to validate it. And what validate means, if you read over here, it's going to validate any response that has a, has a status code within 200 to 299. What is that? Uh, so I have a link here that I'll send, uh, I'll add into the description. And every HTTP request has uh, HTTP status codes. Uh, anything that starts with a one is informational. The twos mean success, which is why it's going to validate if it's from between 200 and 299, because those are the ones that are success responses. You have three, which are redirection. Four means that there's an error on the client. 
and this is where you get the 404 not found error and you have 500 codes and those are server errors. The most common you may see is internal server error. That either means you pass something into the server that they weren't expecting or maybe there's just some bad logic that uh, your, your backend uh, team accidentally implemented. And you may come across this when you're doing the hack challenge. So if you ever come across this, verify that you put in the input that your team member was uh, expecting. Uh, and if not, you can uh, let them know and they'll fix that for you, hopefully. So let's validate this. And now the other thing is that we want to do response data. And this says it's gonna add a handler that's going to call, be called once the request has finished, right? And the handler is a completion handler, right? So uh, this is gonna be highlighted, just hit enter, right? And it's gonna take care of the formatting for you. Uh, remember, is that open and close bracket? This is just a function that doesn't have a name attached to it. So in here, uh, usually call this uh, response because this is the response that you're going to get back from the server. And we're going to do a switch statement because we want to know if that response was successful or not. So if it's successful, uh, first off, we want the results of the response. So in the case that I got a success response, right? I want to do something and I'm going to just uh, put the data that I got in that success case in here. So I'm gonna do stuff here. And otherwise I'm going to print out an error. So this is going to be the error that I get associated with this response. And all you need to do for the error case really is just error.localized description. That's going to print an error. Uh, and this will print it out in the console which uh, you saw if you, uh, whenever you print something out, it shows up in the console on the bottom of your screen. Uh, so what do we want to do to actually uh, decode this data? First off, we need to make a JSON decoder. So let's call that JSON decoder and we'll do this. Uh, let's see if this error goes away, great, okay. Uh, yes, so this is a warning. I never use data. I'm going to use data soon. Uh, now I have a JSON decoder. And what I want to do is I want to decode this data. And to do that, I'm going to use an if flat because there's a chance that I decode this data and it's uh, something's up with it, right? So uh, what am I actually decoding? Uh, well, remember that, uh, let me open Postman. This is what I'm decoding. So this entire thing is what I'm decoding, meaning that this is going to correspond to user's response. So when I'm decoding, uh, I'm going to end up getting, uh, it's going to be a user's response struct. So I'm going to be able to access the success and the data uh, fields of this struct. So let's call this uh, user response. I'm going to make this, e oh, I can call this user's response just to be consistent with the naming. And I want to make this equal to, I want to try to decode and I'm going to use this decode. So this try is just going to uh, make sure I don't error, right? And it's going to uh, return uh, an optional, or it's going to return nil, and it's going to skip this if flat because for some reason I was I encountered an error during decoding. So this will make sure I don't just crash my app if something came in like bad data. So this is a decodable protocol. This is the type I want to put in, and this type is going to be uh, over here. Remember, user's response is what we're expecting to decode it to, so we're going to pass in the user response type or user's response type. So this is the struct and the type you get from self. And I want to extract the data that I got over here. So let's make sure this is an error. And now we're just getting, you know, I never use user's response. So let's assume that the JSON decoder decoded it properly. Now I have a struct over here 
and I have two properties. I have a success property and I have the data property. Now I want to use the data property. So I'm going to access user response. And if I put dot, I should be able to get data. Uh, now data is a users list and that's exactly what I want to pass back. I want to pass back my user list because I want to do stuff to my table view. So let's type in completion. Remember this is the function I'm passing it to and this is the function that's going to run after I've first gotten a response. It's going to run this closure right here. And then it's going to run this other closure after I've decoded the response. So this is what I want to pass in. And let's see, no errors. This is expecting, oh, uh, here we go. Okay, one important thing that I forgot. Uh, you want to make sure that uh, you add escaping. The reason I'm getting this is because this itself is an escaping uh, closure because it's a networking call, right? And people who design Alamo Fire know that we'd want an escaping closure because we don't want to freeze up when we're actually making uh, uh, when we're making a network request. So make sure that you add escaping to all of your completions. Okay, and should go away. Great. Now we have the get users network call, all stored into this function. So where are we going to call it? Uh, if you go back into view controller, we can see that we have over here. You can also look at this and it'll tell you where to do this stuff. Whenever I refresh, this is when I want to get my data, right? So here, uh, first off, I'm just going to comment this stuff out because I don't want to fake that I'm waiting for three seconds to get stuff from the server. I'm actually going to do it for real. So I want to access the network manager. So I'll type in network manager, and then I want to get the users. And this is the completion that I want to use. Uh, I'm going to hit enter so that it sets it up for me. Now, remember, network manager, I have called this completion and I passed in the data. This is my users list. So when I go back here, this is the parameter that's going to correspond to that user list. So whatever I named this is going to refer to the users list that's passed in. If I decoded it properly, and if a response was uh, was successful, so I'm going to call this users list because that's the most appropriate name for it. And here I want to set my user data equal to my user list. If you did uh, extra credit number three uh, for closures, this is what we were expecting you to do. Uh, one thing though, you want to add self. Uh, I can just click fix and I'll do it for you because you are in a closure. Now you're like out of scope. It doesn't recognize things in class scope, right? It's almost like its own little, uh, it has no idea what's going on outside of it, right? So you need to do self.user data and it's going to access uh, whatever you have up here in uh, class scope. Uh, just something you need to do with closures. So we can test this out. Uh, one, one thing I didn't want to mention, uh, if you go into your workspace, it's going to get rid of the phone that you're using previously. So I'm just going to switch it back to 11 Pro. Okay, and let's see. So, okay, there we go. Now, I don't see anything, but that's fine because I only call when I refresh the data. So let's call and looks like we have an issue. The resource could not be loaded because the app transfer security policy requires the use of a secure connection. This is something that has to do with Apple. And if you remember from my very first lecture, uh, whenever you want to do weird stuff, you need to go into info.plist. We used to use it to remove storyboards. Now we're going to need to use it to bypass this thing. This is app transport security. This is only gonna happen if you're trying to do networking stuff uh, locally. Uh, so you're not gonna, you shouldn't encounter this for your homework because uh, you're going to be uh, accessing a deployed server, something that's on the web that you can connect to from wherever. 
because this is running locally on my machine, I'm going to get this issue because it says it's unsecured. We want to go into info.plist. If you're following along, if not, you can just skip this portion. Uh, but it would be good to know this stuff uh, if you want to, if you're um, backend people on your, uh, during the hack challenge, haven't actually deployed the server, because you can just go here and set this stuff up so that you are able to uh, run the server locally on your, on your computer and make sure that everything is working properly. Uh, so here we want to access the app transport security. Uh, we can just scroll through to find it. Or I can also type it. Oh, wait. Yeah, I'll try to type it in. Just app transport. Here we go. Security settings. I'm gonna hit enter on this. And let's click another plus. So now we're here. I want to. There's an option that lets me. Uh, let me see, I think I need to. Yeah, okay, so I made a mistake. It should be inside of this. So I want to click plus. I want to make sure that when I click plus, it's inside of here. Now it's inside of here. And the first option is the, is the one that you want, allow arbitrary loads. This is what's going to allow me to actually run the server locally and access it through uh, Alamo Fire. So I'm going to stop this and I'm going to try again. Oh, wait, oops, one thing. This needs to be yes. Otherwise it doesn't make a difference. Uh, stop this again and we'll run it. And now we're here, so let's refresh. And let's give it some time. Okay, uh, we got some errors. These aren't important. Uh, this is just stuff that happens if you're not using your IP address. Using localhost is just fine. Uh, there are some issues. It looks like it's taken a very long time. That's actually because we didn't stop the refresh control from refreshing. It can stay there like that indefinitely. But the real issue is that we forgot to reload the data. And so while it is in uh, user data, in fact, I can show you that if I were to click here on this pause button, I'm going to, you can ignore this. This is like low level code. Uh, if I were to go into my console and print out, uh, well, actually, I don't think it'll work like that. Uh, let me start it up again. Uh, let's go over here. So what I'm doing is I'm setting a breakpoint. And if I were to uh, refresh this again, well, it won't work now because it's refreshing forever. So what this is called a breakpoint, and this is going to allow me to debug my code. Uh, so if I do this, now I got something green. You may have gotten this accidentally in the past. If you want to get rid of it, you can just swipe to the left, click and hold and swipe left. Uh, and there you go. Or you can just click it and uh, disable it temporarily. So here I'm able to see in my user list, I have one value and it's Joe and is an ID of two, which is exactly what I have on the server. So we did it correctly. Uh, if I were to click here, this will step over, meaning it goes to the next line of code. Uh, I also have some other options, which is step into. I can step into a function because if I click step over a function, I'm never gonna enter that function. So if you want to go deeper into your debugging, you can use these options. Let's say I'm in a function and I'm already not gonna get anything out of being in that function. I can just step out and it takes me back out of that function. Uh, another way I can check to see that user data is uh, actually filled up because I set it equal to users list. I can click on self. There's a lot of stuff here, but it's going to have all of my variables. I can click here and verify that I have it here. Uh, another thing I can do is PO, which is print out, and I'm able to print out. It's going to auto complete for me, right? I can print out user data, I can hit enter, it will give, give me the syntax, or I can do user data and get the first element. And it looks like that did the same thing. It's of no use. Uh, maybe there's a two string. There's no two string. Well, or actually, oh, no, never mind. It's not the same syntax. Okay. This actually printed out the list. Uh, this printed out the user class. And that's why I have an ID of two and username is Joe. That's just a quick intro into debugging. If you want to uh, get out of debugging mode, I can just click here. And I can also set breakpoints without having to reset. Uh, so I don't need to reset each time I set a new breakpoint. 
Uh, but we need to, we do need to stop because we have uh, a refresh control that's running infinitely. The code I had in here is fine to put into here because I want to reload the data on my user table view. And I also want to end the refresh on my refresh control. So we can get rid of these comments, Let's clean up our code a bit. And now we can run this. So uh, I can refresh. Oops, I had a breakpoint. I can just get rid of it over here, swipe left and keep going. And now I have Joe on my table view. So we got every user. Uh, we can test to see if this still works uh, live because this is a server. So let's create a new user. Um, let's say I want to create Bob. Uh, and let's send. And it doesn't look like it updated. Uh, that's because you need to refresh because you need to make another get request. Uh, you can't do, you can't make it so that if you send something, you know that it changed and is going to update here with the way we're doing things. That will require sockets, which is a more advanced topic and out of the scope of this class. Uh, so we can refresh and now we have Joe and Bob. So every time I refresh, I'm going to get updated data from the server. If I were to run get over here, I'm going to have the same stuff here. I decoded this JSON. I have these two objects, which I extracted the ID and the username from to form this string in my table of use cell. So uh, just to show you where that's being done, remember from project four, uh, you take a user object because we're setting this JSON list data to be user data in my refresh data here. I'm passing it into the cells configure function. And what my cell is doing when I configure it is I am setting the username label.txt to be an ID with a colon and the username. One thing to note too is that uh, I don't have a one, it just, uh, it just continued on. And this is important to know when we start doing delete because you don't want to delete based on the index of the row because everything has a unique ID on the server. So you want to refer to the ID. And I'll go more into detail with that when we start delete. But it looks like we're getting everything properly, but we're still creating things on the server and we wanna be able to create things on uh, in our network manager. So let's do that. Uh, we can start with create user. So what are we doing here? Uh, when I created a user, I went to post. I had the same endpoint. So we can just copy this endpoint over because we're using the same one. So that makes things a bit quicker. And we're using a request, uh, is using the same endpoint, there's a method but there is a parameter that we're passing in and we're also, uh, we also have it in a JSON. So we're going to need to, to add some extra things into this function. So it's just best if we choose the right request from the autocomplete again. Now it matters that we use the encoding one because we need encoding and not encoder. So first off, we put endpoint here again. Uh, the method that we're going to be using is a post method. Uh, and now we have parameters. So what, how exactly are we going to represent this in Swift? Uh, well, to do that, you can just make some parameters list. I'll call it parameters uh, like this. And I wanna make a dictionary. So how do dictionaries work in Swift? Uh, well, not in Swift, how, how are dictionaries represented in JSONs? You know that you always have a string key and we might have a value that's either a string or maybe it's an empty list or maybe it's an integer or maybe a boolean like over here there's a whole bunch of things how am i supposed to create a parameters dictionary that takes in a string and takes in any type it's just like that it has string keys and the values can be anything so uh, let's get started with this. Uh, so I'm going to have, the way I represent it here is I have a username. Um, so we're going to type in username 
over here. And then I have a colon. And I'm going to take in the username that I type that I typed in, right? In this case, I'm going to pass that username that I type in to this function. So I'm just going to use the username parameter that I have here. Uh, so let's see what's going on. Great, good. So I never use parameters. No, I will. I'll pass it in here because parameters has to go into parameters. How am I going to encode this? Uh, remember that if you're trying to encode things for a post request and you want to encode them into a JSON, you want to do the JSON encoding, not default encoding now method. Uh, this is in the slides, right? So you can uh, refer to that if you forget this. And uh, remember that if we're doing a get request with query parameters, we want to use URL encoding, but we're not gonna do that in this demo. Remember that we don't use these and so we get rid of them. So just like before, we want to validate to make sure that it's a 200 to 299 status code. And we want to get the response. We want to do something after we get the response from the server. So what are we going to do? Again, we want to switch on the response results. And we want to consider the case where it's successful, in which case I get some data back. Or, oh, this isn't typed on. Uh, I just go on. Or in the case where it's a failure and I'm going to get an error back. Uh, so when I get a failure back, uh, this is, this doesn't work. Uh, I'm going to print out the localized description. And what do I do in the success case? It's going to be super similar to this, right? So let's just copy this over because I want to decode the JSON. So in this case, JSON decoder, right? Uh, I'm using user's response, right? And the user's response type to decode. I'd want to name this user response because I'm only gonna get one user when I create. Uh, remember from the API, I'm going to get one user or when I create, I get a single user, right? Now, a single, single user, uh, do I have that represented in my user models. I have a user's response that has a success and a data that takes in a user list, but I don't have anything specific for something that has a success and specifically just data that represents a user. So I need to make another model to take that into account. So this is going to be my user response. Is that going to conform to codable because I want to win, uh, be able to decode that JSON and here we go. Once again, success is a Boolean and the data that I'm going to get is a user. So now with that taken care of, we can go back here. Uh, so we have the user response and I want to decode based on my user response type. Uh, remember I named this user response because I get back a single user. So uh, with that done, uh, we can also do this. And you'll see it's super similar, right? Everything seemed, uh, turned out to work. And uh, now my completion is going to get a user back. So uh, let's go back into view controller and I'll just click here because this is where I want to post the data. So right now I'm printing out a name. Uh, do you recall if I click here, uh, we have Joe, Bob, uh, do Adam, I will submit and it prints out Adam. So this is the username that I want. Uh, and I already have name here. So I don't want to print it out. I just want to do the network request to create that user. So uh, over here, I'm going to call the network manager. I'm going to access uh, create user because that's what I want to do, create the user. Uh, pass in the name here and I have a completion. Remember, uh, when I go to this completion, whenever I pass in this data, this data corresponds to the single user that I got back from this response. So I'm going to go to here, and this is going to refer to the single user that I got from, make, from the response after making a request to the server. 
So I'm just going to call this user because it's one user. And do I have to do anything here? Well, let's just leave it empty for now because this creates the user. Do I want to do anything after I get the user? Maybe I don't, right? Uh, let's just run this and see what happens. So let's say I, well, first I want to refresh. And let's say I add uh, Adam and let's submit. Nothing happened. Uh, let's refresh again. And now I created Adam. So does it make sense that I click add and it doesn't actually automatically refresh for me? Maybe it would be good to uh, refresh after I call, um, after I create something new, right? So maybe in here, I want to do network manager dot uh, get users, right? Or maybe I can just call what I call whenever I do refresh data and it's going to refresh the data for me because it's called get users. And well, I mean, there's some extra stuff that isn't really necessary. Um, or instead of wasting the time to make another network uh, a network call, realize that you already have that user. You created that user. When you create a user, you got a user back. So you have a user and all you need to do is add that to your list. And when you refresh, that list is going to be overridden, but it's gonna have all the same stuff as before. So if I just append that user that I got back into here, and then make sure that you, oh, remember this is a closure, so it's gonna give me an error. There it is. I need to add self to anything inside of a closure. That refers to something in the original class. I want to refer to my users table view. I'll put in table view. I'm gonna call my table view, user table view. And I want to reload that data. Great, uh, let's try this now. Uh, refresh and perfect. So uh, let's try this one more time. Uh, I have Joe, Bob, Adam, uh, I don't know, test, I ran out of creativity. And now I have a new item. Now I got this not from getting all of the users again, which would have been redundant because I already have three users in there. Why run a network request to get four users now? I ran this create request and it sent something back to me. And so I can just put that thing into my data list until next time when I get all the users. Uh, one thing that you might notice is that every time that we run this, it's empty when we start off. So let's try to fix that now. How about uh, instead of create dummy data, we're just going to uh, get the users in the beginning. Uh, and let's see, what do we want to do here? I want to get my users list. And similar to how I did here with user data equal to all that stuff, user data equal to user list. So let's stop and let's, oh, going too fast. Self. And it looks like it didn't work. That's because I did not reload the table view. So always remember to reload the table view or it's not going to show up. So I set the data, I reload it, and it should show up now. And now everything's here as soon as I open the app. So this looks a lot better now. I refresh, it's going to get new data, but the data that I had is already the same, so it's not gonna make a difference. So the last thing to do now is figure out how to delete things. Uh, I can delete here and I can refresh it, but nothing's gonna happen because while I deleted it locally, I didn't delete it on the server. And I wanna make a network request to specify what user to delete. So let's remember how the delete works. Uh, if I click here on delete, Let's say I want to delete Adam. Uh, so I'm just going to type in ID4. And like I was saying uh, a while back, uh, the reason I want to delete four is because the ID corresponding to Adam is four. 
Now, Adam is in index two of this table view, but that doesn't necessarily correspond to the ID that it is on the server. So I'm going to delete ID four. I'm going to send. I got the user back. And if I refresh, Adam's not there anymore. So let's replicate this, but in our networking manager. So final stretch over here. Uh, one special thing that we need to do is we are using a new endpoint. Uh, it's slash API slash users, but it has something additional to it. We also need to add the user's ID. And to do that, I just put in the ID here directly into my URL, it should work fine. Now we want to do uh, something similar to a get, right? So we can just go back here. Most of the responses are gonna look very similar, right? So I can just copy this one and move it down. So it's using the same endpoint. Our method is now delete. And now we wanna do something different. Uh, so this is getting a specific user. So while it does share some commonalities with get, because I'm only using the endpoint and the method versus using endpoint method and then passing the parameters, it's different from the get because the get is going to give you a list of users while the post is gonna give you a single user. So we want to do stuff similar to how we do in this post. That's why we're getting this issue because I can't convert a type of user list to user because we specified here that our completion is taking in a specific user. So to do that, I'm going to rename my response over here just so that it's consistent. And I want to use user response, not user's response because user response is what we define to have a data field that has a specific user and not a list of users. So that's it. Uh, let's go back to view controller and let's go to where we want to delete things over here. So uh, let's see how we're gonna delete something. I remove it from the table view. Or first of all, I remove it from my data list, right? Then I remove it from my table view and that's it. So I need to make a networking call. Uh, this user's data that I remove is actually going to return an instance of uh, the user. If I check user data that remove, it gives me the documentation associated with it. It removes and returns the element. So I do want to get the user that's deleted. So I'll let deleted user equal to user data. And the reason I want to do that is because it would be nice if I can get the ID of the user to pass it into my delete function. So let's call the network manager dot delete user. Uh, this ID is going to be the deleted user's ID. And for my completion, well, you know, like we said before, what do we want to do after we delete a user? Is there really anything to do? Um, there's not really anything to do, but let's just do this anyways. Let's take in the user and let's just make sure that the user we're getting back has the same ID, uh, same name as the user that we want. So user not username. Let's print that out. Uh, Let's stop this from running and let's verify that everything is fine. I remove it from the data. I delete the row. It was working visually before and I don't really need to reload because you know I have everything I need on the screen visually. Uh, so I can just run this. And let's try adding Adam again. So here's Adam. Now Adam is six, Adam is not four anymore because the biggest number is five. And now let's remove Adam. And now we removed Adam. Adam got printed out. Now our print statement is here. This ran, meaning that our response was received and it was successful. And we also were able to decode the JSON properly that we got back from the server. And that's why we were able to uh, print out Adam. So if I refresh this, 
nothing shows up. And if we click here, go to the get, and we can run get here. We have Joe ID two, Bob ID three, test ID five. And this is what we have over here. So everything matches up. This is the basics of networking. Uh, there will be uh, some other routes on the homework that you can implement that I didn't go over specifically, like for example, getting a specific user or maybe getting uh, um, comments or messages from a specific user using some filtering technique. Uh, that would be using query parameters. So you've been given all the information that you need to do these networking calls, although networking is something that's difficult. So please go to office hours if something is confusing. But just remember, everything that you have here is anything that you're going to need to use for the homework. So everything is in here. So let's go back to the keynote. Uh, move my face. And let's start again. So uh, final words. Uh, this is the last lecture that's associated with a project. Uh, stay tuned with Hack Challenge News because uh, you're going to start with the Hack Challenge very soon. Uh, start thinking of ideas of what you want. Now that you have knowledge about networking, now you can really make whatever you want with an app. You've already reached the end of the course, basically. There's going to be two lectures after this one, which are made by some members of our course staff. Uh, they're going to teach you, uh, it's not determined yet, but they're going to teach you probably some things about other Cocoa Pods that you can use that'd be useful and just nifty tricks to know about Swift. So I highly recommend watching them if you'd like to improve your Hack Challenge project more and start thinking about ideas. Uh, this is a really good thing to put on a resume and it's just something really fun because you get to work with a backend member and a design member and you actually get to work for two weeks to create something of your own after you've learned all of this stuff in the class. And project seven is gonna be due next week, uh, 11.59 p.m. as always. Uh, so yeah, thank you for taking the class. You're almost there. Uh, hope you enjoyed the hack challenge and thank you again.